name of Jesus, we thank you for another day, God, another day that we can worship you. Father, another day that we can love you and honor you and glorify you, Father, for everything that you've done for us. For the great mercy and the great grace that you've bestowed upon us, that you've imputed to us, that you've reckoned to us as righteousness. We thank you, Jesus. And we give you all honor and all praise and all glory. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, turn to Romans, if you have your Bibbles. Again? <laughs> Bibbles. You know, I just learned, I had no idea that Biblos was a city in Phoenicia. And yeah, yeah. Well, I just learned in history because I'm teaching history over at my son's school. <laughs> and so I'm like learning all that. I'm like, wow, didn't know that. And then I come off like I knew it the whole time when I'm teaching the kids. Yeah, you learned, you literally, right? You, as a teacher, you learned it literally like 30 seconds ago. And then all of a sudden you're teaching it like you knew it your whole life. <laughs> so funny. And you don't tell the kids that you just learned it yourself. <laughs> so, but yeah, Biblos, kind of funny. You know, they would uh, trade with Egypt for papyrus, and then they would write down everything, and that's where we get the term Bible from, because it was the first recording of rec- uh, the recording, writing down on the papyrus, you know, uh, for the scrolls and things like that, that they would write. And it came from the city of Biblos, which is where we get the word Bible, which was just north of Tyre and Sidon on the northern section of Israel on the Mediterranean Sea. So, kind of cool. But anyways, um, in Romans 6, everybody there? Romans 6? Yeah, verse 1, yeah. Verse 1. I always, I think I always start in verse 1, so I just say Romans 6 or whatever, Ephesians 3. Yeah, like, I don't think I've ever started in the middle of the chapter because it doesn't make sense to me. To start in the middle of the chapter. I mean, some, I guess sometimes it does, you know, you pick out a verse and they say, wow, this verse spoke to me. To me, the whole Bible speaks to me. It really does. And that's actually kind of what I want to talk about a little today, so. Um, verse one, what shall we say then? What shall you say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? I want to say Paul had a, a very lame interpretation, or my Bible says, certainly not you know, with an exclamation point. I want to say Paul went, are you stupid? What, like, what are you talking about? Shall you continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, if you think about the verse that we just read, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What he's really saying is, what they were actually saying is, grace is so amazing that we want to get it over and over and over again. And I thought, the verse is really saying grace is absolutely incredible to experience grace. And they want to know how they get it again. And so they said, well, we were in sin, right? And we were pagans and we were following after all the gods of Rome and we were following after all the gods that um, we believed, you know, would bring us life. And then we encounter this true God, you know, in Christ Our old flesh is cut away from us, right? We experience new life, you know? And they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they were like, woo You know? And they live this new life. Their hearts were, for the first time in their life, fully alive to God. And they thought, how do we live this forever? I mean, really a lot. Like, when I was a new believer, I thought, you know, like, experience Jesus... You know, you're like, well, maybe if I go back and do that life again, then God will save me again. (laughs) Right? Which is actually, I think, I did actually do that once. (laughs) And he saved me again, so whatever. So, but think about the incredibleness of grace. The incredibleness of grace is that grace is, obviously the definition is, is divine favor, unmerited favor, something that you receive that you did not earn, Right? Grace is the power of God at work in your heart to bring you unto, into relationship with God. You know, it's His grace. I always say that mercy is the vessel to bring us to grace. You know, that we sh- we're shown mercy by God. And mercy is in relationship also to your circumstances. That a lot of times God's mercy, right, um, is in the different situations that we encounter. But that ends up bringing us to repentance. And repentance brings us into grace. You cannot 
have grace without eventually having repentance. And so sometimes, you know, we're not all the same either. We have to stop thinking in monolithic terms as if we're all the same. Some people repent because they realize who they are and that's God's work in their heart, right? The Holy Spirit convicting them and bringing conviction and they fall on their face. And other people, it's a process, a long process sometimes of wrestling with God. You know, uh, you ever see the movie Case for Christ with Lee Strobel? This is a good movie. I, I would recommend seeing it. I thought they did a, a very good job um, demonstrating that here's a man who, you know, was was pursuing the scientific method of trying to figure out God. And his wife had gotten saved, become a Christian, and was praying for him. But it took him a long while to come to that place in his life when he really encountered God. But he did. He ended up coming to faith. You know? So God is that, you know, simply because somebody doesn't have this exact reaction of one person. You know, um, Keith Green once wrote a song, and he was like, in his song, he was apologizing. I'm so sorry. I just want to see you there. And I'm not quoting the words right, but I can understand, like, you know, the people who encounter the Lord for the first time, and then they tell all their friends, and they want their friends immediately to have the same reaction. Not realizing that, well, it took you many years to get to the point of God working on your heart, you know? Grow, maybe you grew up in church. Maybe you heard messages over and over again. Maybe something happened in your life. But the goal is to get to Romans 6. The goal is to get to, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because we want grace to abound in our life. We want that. That is the true desire of our heart, that grace may abound. But Paul says, certainly not. Are you crazy? What's wrong with you? How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? His body for your body. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is the good news that somebody gave their body so that your entire body could be redeemed. That every cell of your body could be redeemed. That everything in you could be now now God's, glorifying Him and honoring Him and having relationship with God. It's not a simply a spiritual... I talked to my sister last night and there's this thought that somehow... Um, you know, it, it is about our spirit inside of us, our spirit man. Our spirit man being renewed inside of us. But our body, our soul, our spirit is one. It's not as if I'm a body inhabiting a spirit and the spirit comes out of me when I die and therefore um, nothing, God doesn't care about the body. He does. And actually your bodies will be resurrected one day. Every single human being will be resurrected because Christ rose from the dead. And because Christ rose from the dead, you will all rise. I promise you. That is in the scriptures. So when we we all rise in the body, that means that the body must have been pretty important. Now people beat the tar out of their bodies. They do. They beat the living tar out of their bodies. They they treat their bodies poorly, right? They because of sin. Sin is a weight. It's a weight that bears on our shoulders. You know, and it gets into us. And we start to treat ourselves that way because that's why we think about ourselves. And when the gospel comes to us, it is the circumcision of the, of the sin, cutting away of the sin. That thing that comes on us and gets in us that, um, that really is attempting to destroy us. So he says, Paul says, if, if you've died to sin, you can't live any longer in it. In verse 3, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. If he died, you've been baptized, and you believe in his death, you believe that he died, then you've been baptized into the death of Jesus Christ. So you died with Christ. That you've been put to death with Jesus Christ. And people go, I actually was teaching on this to fifth graders the other day, in a Bible class, I was teaching to fifth graders. And I said to them, the biggest problem, the, the problem is that we, we see. And I said, how, what is the ultimate way that God would deal with the problem of us seeing the sin? Like us consciously being aware of everything around us. What is the one way that, that Jesus said, now if you were blind, you would have no sin, but because you say you see, your sin remains. How does God then want us to become blind again? 
like Adam. Adam was blind in the garden. He didn't have the consciousness. He didn't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't wasn't aware of it. And by the way, we can't handle it as people, the good and evil in the world. We can't handle it. There's way too much for us to see and hear and do and this and that and come on. I mean, it's just too much for human beings to handle. So then we have to form parties. We have to form who's right, which party do you vote for? I mean, come on, as if it, the other party are, are the most wicked and evil group of people and this group of party is most righteous and they shine like the sun. <laughs> like, and I didn't say which one. Right? But that's how we think. So, you know what I'm saying? So I'm saying something has influenced our, our thinking because we, we, we simply can't handle all of that stuff. And I, I was teaching the fifth graders, I said, so what would be the way that God handles, that God would uh, choose to ultimately close our eyes? What is the ultimate closing of our eyes? And the kids, the fifth graders, kids are the most unbelievable group of kids. They get it like that. Kids understand the truth of the gospel quicker than adults. Sorry to tell you guys. <laughs> Kids get it. And they all looked at me and they said, death. Fifth graders, they all looked at me and they said, well, you'd have to die. And I said, exactly. So somebody closed their eyes so you could live. And the entire class went, <gasps> Revelation with children. They get it. They understand the fullness and truth of who God is. The revelation to say that somebody had to close their eyes in order so your eyes could be open to the reality of God. And that's what Paul's talking about here. He's saying we were buried with him through baptism into death. In verse 4, just as Christ was then raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, verse 5, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, so that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So Paul talks about the fact that somehow there's a body of sin. What is a body of sin? What is it? It is something, obviously, that had attached itself to my body. It was called the flesh. It was called the sin nature. Whatever you want to call it. It had attached itself to me. I always say that sin is a power in the earth that works to destroy humanity. And so, in these verses, what Paul is saying is that when we die with Christ, when we're raised in the likeness of his resurrection, never to die again. So now, we can celebrate and say yes! Right? We can say yes to God, because now we've been united with him also in his resurrection. Jesus said he died for once, died for once, and then was raised to defeat death, hell, and the grave, to destroy the power of the devil, who held, held death in his grip. So, What Paul is saying is that we now, if we've been united with him in death, we will also be united with him in his resurrection. So we can now experience the resurrection life. And that's what we really do when we worship. Is that we're coming together to say that the resurrection life uh, is is what we're desiring. And worship should resonate with some heaviness in our hearts. It always does with me that there's a heaviness to worship. Praise is a little different. Worship is this awe of God, I think. It's an awe of God. I'm saying yes to God. I'm, I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to move into that place in my life, right? And there's a weight. The actual Hebrew word means weight. So when Jesus has removed the weight of sin, he doesn't give me a neutral thing. He gives me another weight. <laughs> but the weight is the glory of God, and it brings me low. And so that's why I bow. That's why I fall on my face. That's why I bend, I bend low. That's why I repent. Because the weight of his glory has now taken over the place that was removed, that body of sin. Now he gives me the body of glory upon myself. 
and I can worship Him. And that worship should then respond into praise, into saying, yes, I'm set free, yes, thank you, God. And then it should relate also into our relationships with one another. We should, I don't know, have a joyful countenance when we're talking with people. We should have the ability to listen to what other people are saying. All of that stuff should resonate with us. In verse 7, For he who died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, verse 8, we believe that we shall also live with him, verse 9, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Verse 10, For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Verse 11, last verse. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what does it mean to reckon yourself? I'm actually asking you. Who has a response? What does it mean to reckon? There's a reckoning coming. Remember like from a movie? (laughs) Like a western there's a reckoning. What does a reckon mean? A what? A revelation? Yeah, yeah. Like a uh, like an accounting to something, like accounting, right? There's a reckoning, like you have to pay for something, right? If we go to Genesis 15, you don't have to turn there, but if you go to Genesis 15, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Accounted. It was put into his bank account. <laughs> right? Abraham believed God, and God was like, chick, 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 chick. <laughs> made a deposit. God made a deposit in his spiritual bank account. Let me ask you a question. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Is that the end of Abraham's story? We never heard from Abraham again? Or was that the beginning of the story? It's kind of the beginning of the story, right? Like, God showed up to Abraham. Abraham wasn't necessarily looking for God. The story doesn't say that. But the story says that Abraham was living in Ur, which is a city in uh, Sumer, Sumeria, uh, Mesopotamia, okay, the Fertile Crescent, right, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Okay? So Abraham is living in the city of Ur. It was about 100 miles from Babylon. So just giving you, like, right above the Persian Gulf, where modern-day Iraq is. All right. So Abraham's living in that region, right? All those people in that region all had their own gods. They all worshipped different deities, and they all had ziggurats. The Tower of Babel, I believe, was a ziggurat. The people were building a ziggurat to worship a deity, and God was like, "Not me!" <laughs> so He destroyed their ziggurat. He just He decimated it, and then they went and they built other ziggurats to other gods. But they were like, "Not to Yahweh. You're not going to build one." He didn't allow it. Isn't that amazing that God didn't allow them to build a temple or worship center to them for God until God did something first. He had to do something first for us to be able to understand how we worship Him. Because all the people of that day, they all worshipped deities. They all had different deities and one deity and the king. The king was like the deity and the deity was like the king. And then one god would fight another god and they would declare war. And then in Babylon, Marduk became the deity. And Marduk then conquered the whole region through the Babylonian Empire. And and God was like, not my, that's not how I'm going to operate. So God started, so God saw this guy, Abram. Something must have been different about him that God saw in him. Same thing with Noah. Something must have... I, don't you want to be that person? I do. I'm like, I still want to be that guy. Like, that God was just like, my servant Job, right? My servant Paul, right? My servant Kelly. Like, he just... He sees something in us that says, wow, I want that person to do what what no one else at the time could do a Billy Graham or whoever it might be. He just saw something and they said, and all it is is really is, yes. God said, Abram, he said, yes. I don't even know if he, he didn't know Yahweh. He didn't know the one true God. Like, it doesn't say that. But he, the Lord spoke to him and somehow this man was sensitive enough 
to hear the voice of God and say, yes, come out from among your people. Okay. <laughs> right? He does. And then I'll show you a land and I'll make your descendants look up to the heavens. It must have been cool to have not have uh, light pollution in that day and age, right? Where you could see the stars. Look up to the heavens and see the stars. I'll make your descendants like the stars of the sky. Did Abraham understand that one day you and I would be his descendants? No, of course not. He didn't understand that. Right? He thought his descendants were going to come through his natural lineage. Right? Through, he was going to have a son, and his son would have children, his son's children. He didn't know that one day there were all going to be this spiritual family that God raised up in the earth, and every single one of them was somehow directly related to what Abraham did, because the descendants would come through the lineage of Jesus Christ. That Abraham to Jesus, Jesus to you. Abraham didn't know that. But he did what? He just said, yes. And I, I, I say this in Romans 6 because it's simply belief. It's simply saying yes to God. Say yes to Him. And when we say yes, there's nothing He cannot do with us. It's amazing. When we say yes, I, I heard a testimony recently, a kid named Kyle Hubbard. If you ever want to watch it, it's called The Day Kyle Died. And here's this kid at University of Arkansas and he's a like party animal and all this type of stuff and partying it up and um, he said his whole world just collapsed in on him. You know, he said, I was like one thing away from everything caving in. I had built up this big house of cards, he said. It's a beautiful testimony. And through this process, he just basically drinks himself almost to death. And he gets checked into a rehab facility. And he said, my heart gave out in the rehab facility. I mean, here's this, he was 21, 22 years old. And in that space, in that place of his heart giving out, he said he was brought into this place of like utter darkness. But there were other people there. And he said, I didn't know what to do, except I cried out, I screamed, yes. And he said, in the moment he said yes, he said, boom, he was back in his body, and he said, and I, I was awake on the, in the hospital and I had a tangible peace that surrounded me. And then he said, and up on the wall in like white hot letters, he said it was like lightning. He said, it said John 3.16. And he said, and I knew the one I was saying yes to was Jesus. Why is it that Jesus is always the one who's always there at the last moment in our life? Because he's good at it. He is good at it. I actually always said, I always said once, I said, it's like his job. Like, just do your job, Jesus. That's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus does. It's like his job. His one job is to rescue people at the moment that, right? At the moment that, that they're ready to, to be rescued. And this kid had this, this just amazing Revelation, And then about a month later, two months later, whatever, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he said, and that, that was the point when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit that all the desires fell off of me. Because he said when he, he came out of the hospital, he still wrestled with that stuff. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Paul says that you're baptized into something. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about baptism. He said, you're either baptized into Christ Jesus, and if you've been baptized into Christ, you've been baptized into his death, and therefore you're baptized into his life. And his life is living by the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Or, you're baptized into being slaves of sin. Whatever it is that you obey, you become a slave to that thing. So, we need new life to redirect us, to move us in this direction. And, and the whole thing is, it's always grace. Because it was grace with Abraham. Abraham, right, was moved by great, the grace of God. He didn't know what the end was going to, what, what was going to happen in his life. And he falls and he, he lies about um, um, Sarah being his wife down in Egypt. And, right? and then the funny part is, Isaac lies about his wife. It's, it's kind of like, you got a family lineage trait going on there. You know? And then, we see this thing like that he he then God says I'm going to bring from you and Sarah 
a descendant. And he's like, sure, okay, here's Hagar. <laughs> you know? I mean, so he takes it upon himself to try to implement and try to do what only God can do. And we do the same thing constantly. 